The problems plaguing a town lead Aang and company to leave the physical world. This is Avatar Explained for episode 107, The Spirit World, part 1. Synopsis. Aang comes across a devastated land. There's nothing but ash and soot and decay and suffering. He's disheartened, and initially Katara can do nothing to help him. But then she finds an acorn and throws it at him, and uses this acorn to show him that yes, even though there was great devastation here because of the Fire Nation, the land is going to eventually come back. Nature will rebound it will not be extinguished entirely. And this gives Aang hope and courage. And he proceeds into town. They learn this town has been ravaged by a spirit. The spirit, called Heibai, is furious because of the destruction of the forest, and he is taking out his anger on the townspeople. Even though the destruction of the forest was not the fault of the townspeople, but the fault of the Fire Nation. Aang, being the bridge between the human world and the spirit world, must go and talk to the spirit and prove to the spirit that the people of this town are innocent and should not be harmed. However, this does not go well at first, and the spirit swats Aang away. Sokka attempts to help him, but only ends up getting captured himself. So Aang has to go after Sokka, and he ends up in the spirit world. At first, he's completely bamboozled. He has no idea what's happened. He goes back to the town, but because he's in the spirit world, they can't see him. He's completely alone. Thankfully, he receives help from the dragon belonging to Avatar Roku. And with this help, he eventually convinces the spirit to not attack the town by showing the spirit the same acorn that Katara gave him. The forest will come back. The damage is terrible, yes, but it is not permanent. It is not catastrophic. Nature will come back. This pacifies the spirit, which turns into a panda, and the spirit stops plaguing the town. All is well for Aang and the group. Zuko also has problems in this episode. Uncle Iroh is captured while taking a bath in a hot spring. Zuko must try to find him. The Earth Kingdom soldiers who have captured Iroh are not unclever, but Iroh is very smart and he outwits them, leaving a trail for Zuko to follow. Eventually Zuko does find him and the two of them team up to take out the Earth Kingdom soldiers. It's definitely the B-plot, it's not as interesting or as important as the A-plot, but it does a lot to advance the whole idea that Zuko is his own character with his own motivations and his own adventures. He does not simply exist as Aang's antagonist. He has a life outside of Aang's stories. And the storyline also serves to reiterate the bond between Zuko and Iroh, it's a very warm and caring bond. Zuko can say and do some terrible things, including to his uncle, but his love for his uncle is genuine, and one can really see that here. Part 2. Analysis. If I do have one major criticism of this episode, it's that this episode serves mainly as setup. It's not bad setup, it's quite good, and it's quite efficient, and it's quite professional, but it also means this episode isn't as appealing and poignant and powerful as some of the best in the series. Yes, it does carry the sense that the show is going somewhere, that it has an actual pulse, it has propulsion. The pacing is very good, contrary to a few of the earlier episodes in the show, but it's still set up. It still feels like the appetizer before the main course, and this even extends to some of its more notable accomplishments, like how it introduces the spirit world. The spirit world is very important in the world of Avatar, and it will be further explored 
not just in this show, but also in Korra. However, the spirit world in this episode is very rudimentary, it's very inchoate. There's not a lot to it, and if you're the kind of person who likes to think about inconsistencies in art, which I am absolutely not for the record, but if you are that kind of person, you will have a lot of fuel in this episode. The version of the spirit world presented here is incompatible on a narrative level, though not on a thematic level, with the spirit world presented in later episodes and, of course, in Korra. Is this bad? Well, no, but it's also not that interesting or complicated. The spirit world is just there. It feels more gimmicky than anything else. There's a lot to explore here, but the show doesn't really go there. It's a decent 101, but I wouldn't exactly call it a fantastic presentation of what will become a very important feature of the show. The spirit world is here more of a shadow of the physical world than its own distinct place. And that's kind of disappointing, but it's not bad. And I like Aang seeing Roku's dragon, and I love how even Iroh can sense the dragon, owing to his own spiritual connection. It's all very nice and pretty and subtle. I just wish that the show had done more with the spirit world in this episode. I understand there's only so much you can do, but I do wish it had done a little more. Especially considering how much the show does end up doing with it in later episodes. It shows that potential. It's just not exercised that much here. More interestingly, this is also the first time we get an introduction to Roku, the avatar directly before Aang. We see a lot more of Roku later on. We also get more characterization of Iroh, who, it turns out, is quite a capable warrior, even in his old age. We really see who this man was, how he was the Dragon of the West, this top general, very strong and determined and resolute. He's definitely more spiritual than he was back then, and less aggressive, but he is the same guy in terms of physical skills. He's very capable, and I love how creative he is. I mean, he's basically naked here, much to Zuko's chagrin, but he's able to use those chains to defeat the Earth Kingdom soldiers. He manages to take the very elements that are being used to oppress him, to restrict him, and use those elements to his advantage. That's quite impressive, and it really shows how creative Iroh is, and how he's not afraid to think about the world from a different perspective than his opponents and those around him which is an important part of his characterization as a warrior, but also as a person and as a mentor. Zuko is very myopic at this point, even though his love for Iroh is real and genuine, and honestly really tender and beautiful. As a whole, he still has this very limited perspective. Iroh is able to see further. He doesn't know what will happen. He doesn't claim to be perfect. He's definitely not this saintly, flawless mentor that you see in too many works, but he has learned from everything that's happened to him, and all of that has given him a unique perspective on the world. And of course, he's very connected with his environment and with nature, and indeed, this whole episode has very heavy environmental themes. Now, Avatar as a whole is an environmentalist show, and that's impressive and applaudable, and it does a lot with these themes throughout its course. Although here, I wouldn't say they're presented as well as they could have been. It's not bad, it's just simple, it's straightforward. It's the kind of thing you see in a lot of kids' shows, although it's, again, it's done much better here than on those shows, but it's still the same type of storyline. Not the kind of very profound, very thought-provoking environmentalist message we get in something like Princess Mononoke. Environmentalism is important to Avatar, but it's best in the show when it's played subtly. It's at the very heart of the show. There is no taking environmentalism out of Avatar. You don't have a show. You have a bunch of people connected with nature, 
coming together to defeat a massive empire that's very heavily associated with heavy pollution and in industry. But I will say the points where it's most overt in its environmental messages aren't as effective as they could have been, and this is one of them. It's alright, and I like it, and it's very beautiful, but it's not quite as complex and nuanced as it could have been. Part 3. Context. As far as setup episodes go, this one is quite effective at setting up The Winter Solstice Part 2, Avatar Roku, i.e. the next episode in the show. We've been meandering for a couple episodes. It's go It's been good meandering, but it's still meandering. This is the episode where we really take a step forward toward something resembling a conclusion of the first part of this season. In episode 8, we get the first real declaration of purpose in the show. We get a real timetable and a real sense of meaning. The Avatar needs to defeat the Fire Lord before the comet comes. That is the objective from episode 8 all the way to the very end of the show. It's very consistent that way. So yes, Avatar episode 8 has a lot to cover, and it's able to do that very effectively in large part because of this episode, because this episode sets up everything so well and is very tightly and smartly written. There's no getting around that it's set up, but if it's good setup, who cares? Especially when there are so many episodes of this show that execute well on all this setup that's been given. Now, of course, this episode does not solely exist just to set up episode 108. There are also some little things that are important in other parts of the show. One of my favorites is the Sokka bathroom joke. I mean, it's silly, it's juvenile, but it works. Sokka, when he comes out of the spirit world, wants to go to the bathroom, because there are no bathrooms in the spirit world. This comes back in episode 306, The Avatar and the Fire Lord. Aang emerges from the spirit world, and he has to use the bathroom. And Katara's like, are there any bathrooms in the spirit world? And Sokka says something to the extent of, as a matter of fact, there are not. <laughs> Which... Honestly, it would just be a throwaway line, but because it calls back to this episode, it's clever and smart. And it's a good example of how this show is so willing to make its prior episodes matter, even as it races toward more grand and more portentous and more important stakes. It never loses track of all these little episodes, and because of that, from the perspective of the whole show, these little episodes never feel like a waste of time. They always feel like they're building to something important and real and meaningful. The rest of how this episode functions in the context of the show has to do with two important factors, Sokka and Heibai. Let's start with Heibai. So Heibai comes back at the end of season one. He kind of has to because He's the only important figure Aang knows in the spirit world, and his inclusion at the end of season one when Aang goes to find Ko makes the spirit world feel a little more personal and a little less anonymous. It's not bad, but it's also kind of perfunctory. I do wish they had dived a little more into Heibai's personality and psyche, other than having him just be this rampaging spirit who's angry at what's happened to nature and then is immediately pacified when Aang shows him, oh yes, nature can be restored, balance can be brought back, everything that has been destroyed by the Fire Nation in the last hundred years can be revived. He's not a bad character, but he's also not that interesting. More interesting is how Aang reacts to him. I love how in uh, episode 303, The Painted Lady, Aang when he's chasing what he thinks is the pain lady, but is really Katara, he's like, Oh! Hey! Come back! I've met Heibai! Really going for that idea that he has a personal connection with the spirits. <laughs> it's a nice example of Aang's kind of idiosyncratic goofiness being used to the show's advantage. More interesting, at least to me, is how Sokka's characterization in this episode impacts the characterization of him as a whole. Sokka has always been stubborn, but this episode really does a great job at demonstrating just how stubborn he is. His will is iron, but that's not inherently a good thing. 
and it does lead him to rushing off in situations that he shouldn't. If Sokka doesn't run off to help Aang, he doesn't get trapped in the spirit world. The fact that he gets trapped in the spirit world does not help Aang. If anything, it hurts Aang and forces Aang to do a lot more to rescue him. Sokka's stubbornness features heavily in episodes to come as well. Uh, the first real example of this is in episode 110, Jet, where Sokka says that they should all rely on his instincts and that he's the great leader and then he leads them right into a Fire Nation camp. <laughs> it's kind of amusing and kind of sad. So Sokka's stubbornness is definitely shown to be a negative there, but it's also a positive at some points. It means he doesn't give up. It means that he's always there for those who need him. He's not as much of a passionate, bleeding heart as Katara, but he does care deeply about those around him, and he fights for them the best he knows how, even if it does lead to him charging ahead and not really thinking about what could happen. Sometimes his stubbornness pays off. In episode 110, Jet, Aang and Katara are pulled in by Jet's charisma and his man of the people talk. But Sokka thinks. He's still stubborn. His perception of Jet is locked in from the start and it never shifts. But he still thinks and he's not afraid to go outside of what other people are saying. He's not afraid to say, hey, Jet isn't this great guy, he says he is. He can't be trusted. And of course, in that instance, he's right. And this is a great example of the show doing something I really like, where a character's flaw is not just a flaw, it's also highly connected to a great strength of theirs. Sokka's stubbornness gets him into a lot of trouble, but it also means he thinks for himself, and he's not afraid to do something that people tell him he shouldn't. And it's one of the major aspects of his personality that makes him such a good leader by the end of the show, and such a good tactician. His plan to invade the Fire Nation by Solar Eclipse is brilliant, and if not for Azula, it would have succeeded. Sokka is a great strategist, and the show does a good job at showing where that comes from. It comes from his streak of independence, his desire to forge his own path, and that all is very closely connected to the stubbornness we see here. Nevertheless, this is really Aang's episode, with an assist from Zuko, who proves himself to be more tender and heartfelt, at least in regards to his uncle, than we've seen him thus far. Zuko's greatest attribute is his loyalty to his uncle, and he really knows that. He disappoints his uncle, and it eats away at him. It kills him to do that. At least when he's given time to think on his actions, he grows to really treasure that relationship even when he's myopic and short-sighted in other respects. And we really see that here. I like it a lot. Anyway, thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. Donate to my Patreon if you can. And whatever you do, don't forget to tune in for the next episode of Avatar Explains. So thank y'all. Adios, comrades!